Hey everyone, it's Mark. Today's episode is sponsored by Paint Care. Paint Care is the industry's own solution for the problem of post-consumer paint waste. The organization has already collected over 50 million gallons and redirected them from landfills and waterways. Paint Care currently operates in 10 states and the District of Columbia with New York, the 11th state, coming online in May of 2022. Paint Care is both good for the environment and your business. 35% of dealers who sign up to be a Paint Care drop-off location report new customers shopping in their store as a direct result of their participation in Paint Care. To learn more about Paint Care, go to paintcare.org forward slash retailers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. It's Mark. With me today on my episode is Dan Trottencheck. Dan is the Chief Operating Officer of the NHPA. That's the North American Hardware and Paint Association. That is the trade organization which oversees and lobbies for, as well as advocates for, independent paint retailers, as well as hardware and lumber. Hardware and lumber was their existing business. They added paint to their responsibilities just a couple of years ago after the merger with the PDRA. That was the Paint and Decorating Retailers Association. Dan's group is doing some really terrific work, particularly in the area of training. They've put together some good advice for paint retailers who are having trouble hiring now, which is a problem that I think all retailers are struggling with. And so I wanted to get Dan on talking about some of the tips and secrets that they're sharing with their members that are helping them build staff and hire in a very difficult time. But as important as the hiring, if not more important, is the ability to be able to maintain your staffing levels and keep them efficient. And the way to do that is through training. And so they have some really good systems in place already, and they're doing some new things. And I really wanted to expose all of you guys to them. So give a listen to what Dan has to say, like, subscribe, and let me know what you think. So, hey, everybody, thanks for joining me. With me today is Dan Trottencheck. Dan is the Chief Operating Officer and Publisher at the NHPA. That's the North American Hardware and Paint Association. Dan, how are you this morning? I'm doing good, Mark. Thanks for having me on. I always enjoy sitting down and talking to you, whether it's whether we're recording it or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, great to see you. I know this is your second time on our show. So why don't you just quickly tell people what it is that you are doing at the NHPA and, and a quick summary of what the organization is up to, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Kind of my personal role there is I've been with NHPA, which uh, up until a couple of years ago now was NRHA. And I have been with the association. This is my 26th year. The Um, name change caused by a merger with the PDRA for those who don't follow the politics of trade organizations. Exactly. We, uh, We expanded our membership to include paint and decorating retailers. And as a reflection of that, we changed our name from the North American Retail Hardware Association to the North American Hardware and Paint Association. That's the name change. And our new form is really not a lot different from our last form other than the businesses we serve. But our mission, first off, we are a not-for-profit trade association, so we don't have shareholders that we have to serve. We don't, we don't have owners, the paint decorating retailers, hardware, home center, business, uh, lumberyards. Those businesses are really the closest thing to owners that we have. And our mission is really simple. We, uh, you know, we've been around for 122 years, and our mission is to help these small business operators do a better job at what they're doing, help home improvement retailers, paint decorating retailers run better and more profitable operations. And so we try and do that through providing education back to the channel, doing research about trends in the cha- channel, kind of serving as a voice of advocacy for these small business owners who run these operations. And you were in that position for so long, uh, Mark. As, as we go to work every day, that's what kind of consumes us is what are the things we can do to help small business owners run their businesses more effectively? And so that's a great segue for where you and I had talked about starting here, because everybody listening knows that the country is is currently in the grips of a pretty severe labor shortage. 
and dealers, at least on the paint side, and I know hardware has also had some a fair amount sure. of growth, but I'm not as familiar with the numbers, but most of the paint dealers I know are 25% bigger and struggling right. uh, to find staff enough to keep up with current demand. One of the things that uh, came up during our prep was was what you called ABR, which caught my attention because I had actually just written a blog about a week or two before you and I connected, where I basically said ABR, ABR, for those who don't know, is always be recruiting. Dan, why don't you talk about what you're uh, advising dealers to do in that regard? Well, and this is really, really nothing new and and not to keep referencing the pandemic, but I've said this multiple times that, that the pandemic in a lot of ways didn't change the trajectory of things we need to do or things we need to be concerned on, but it accelerated it. And I have heard from independent home improvement owners for so long, it's hard to find good people. It's always a struggle to find good people. Well, now because of everything, all those other conditions, it's, it's that much harder. But one of the pieces of advice we've been giving for a long time and that in all the presentations I've always given about hiring and maintaining a quality staff is this little acronym of ABR. And, and it, it, for me, it, it references back to the old Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, always be closing, but instead it's always be recruiting. And, and you should always, as a business owner or manager, wherever you go, and, and it underscores the importance of you need to find people that are a culture fit for your company. And you need to find people that are an attitude fit. And quite frankly, to put it above all else, a brand fit for your company. Who are the people out there that fit with the kind of service you want to offer, with the kind of attitude you want to have? Because that is the number one thing that's going to make a difference for the customers coming in your store. Um, And And those kind of people you can find anywhere. You can find them in the drive-thru. You can find them at the dry cleaners. You can find them at at another business. Um, At At another non-paint business. Let me me interrupt you. One of my best employees, we we had a large staples down the street from uh, one of my stores where, where I used to shop for, you know, whatever, paper and staples and whatever else I needed. They had a guy there who was always just really helpful to me. And I was always really impressed. And I got to know him over a couple of months of shopping. And I ultimately hired him and he ended up staying with me for a number of years and was a valued employee, all just yeah. from thinking, I could teach him the paint stuff, just like right. Staples taught him where the copy paper is. I could teach him where the regal wall satin is. But what I can't teach is that attitude of how hard yeah. this guy is trying to help me, you know, complete my transaction. And so one of the kind of basic tips that I give, and I've, I've loved to see this over the years, is that every one of you who's a manager or owner should either on your business card or on a separate business card, have something printed on the back of it that that says to the effect of, I really appreciate the interaction and service you delivered to me. If you're ever looking for a career change or a new opportunity, please reach out to me. We think you'd be a great part of the Dan's paint team. (laughs) And have that ready and give that to people that you see. And it's it's not poaching to present someone with an opportunity. I mean, it's different if you say, I am going to go in there with the intent of hurting this other company and trying to take their employees just because I want to take their employees. I think all is fair in terms of saying, you are a quality person. I want to genuinely give you an opportunity to grow with my business. And and that's and there's nothing wrong with that. But like you said, uh, you can teach those skills. In fact, I think anyone would tell you, I I can teach you how to do these things. You have to have the right motivation and attitude. Just ask things like the United States Marine Corps about things like that. We're going to look for people with motivation and attitude and who want to be part of a team. Then we'll teach them how to fly helicopters and how to to, do those kind of things, because those are the skills we can teach. Um, And I always use this example of these people who say, well, I'm only going to hire people who, you know, had X number of years experience in the business. And and I put it to them this way is like, 
you know, I, I use this little anecdote of what if you have Roy who works in whatever area of your store and Roy was a paint contractor for 40 years and now he's kind of retired and, but he knows everything about painting and, and, and mixing paint and he, cause he's been there and done that. But what if Roy is a surly SOB right. and <laughs> nobody wants to deal with Roy and That's Roy right. scares customers away. And so what, great, you got a lot of knowledge, but, but if you can't translate that to a retail environment, it does you, in fact, it doesn't just do you no good, it can do you harm. So always and, being recruiting and looking right. for that culture fit, brand fit and attitude fit. If you're always recruiting, what I tell people is you never feel as desperate to make a hire. And, well, and yeah. that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So many people are, are hiring the, the Mr. Right uh, Mr. Right here, I should say, right. rather than the Mr. or Mrs. Right. And what are, what are you telling people about that strategy? There's absolutely nothing worse that you can do than to crisis hire. For every one time it works out, there's 10 examples of it not working out. First, I, I, I want all retailers, all small business owners to think about this. Your employees are the manifestation and delivery vehicle for your culture and your brand, period. If you want to say that we are the place that has the most knowledge, if we are the place, you should come to us instead of some other store that just pushes gallons of paint. You should come to us because we provide service, we provide insights, we provide knowledge. That's your brand promise. And your, and your employees are the only way that that gets delivered. So they are the most critical aspect of delivering on your brand promise. That's thing one. So if you want to put that at risk, I, I hear the phrase, I just need a beating heart. I just need someone right. who has a pulse. And that's just so wrong headed. And, and, and I, you know, I get a lot of people saying, well, yeah, sure, Dan, you don't have to have someone cover next Thursday's shift and you don't know what that's like. I totally get it. I, I, I do get it. And I'm not blind to the fact that there are realities that can sometimes put you in the situation where you need people. But I think what like in any scenario, what you have to do is mitigate your exposure. And what I mean by that is doing things like practicing ABR. The other thing that we recommend is to so that you don't have to hire in crisis, right? So that you don't have to hire in crisis. The other thing thing that we recommend, which is uh, the the kind of the second phases of ABR, are ABI and ABH. Always be interviewing and always yep. be hiring. Yep. One of the things that we often recommend is to have a regularly scheduled day of the month where you're conducting open interviews. Not, I have to hire a position, so I'm going to I'm going to all of a sudden try and get ads out there and then start hiring people. Say, the second Thursday of every month, we are having open interviews at our operation. Um, the other thing we recommend is to have group interviews. Have, have you and your manager or your manager and assistant manager, whoever kind of does the hiring, do that first round of group interviews and bring the three or four people in, sit them down in your conference room or your break room and say, hey guys, so, so glad to have you here. We want to go through some basic questions. And by doing those group interviews, it allows you to see how they think on the spot how they interact with one another. And it's a quick and efficient way to look at more candidates and, and kind of get through that first level of screening in a very efficient way. Now, a lot of you guys are saying, Dan, I can't get one person to show up for an interview. I mean, it's all about creating this, this stream, this, this, well, we know that they always have open interviews on Thursdays, but then you got to look at what are the other things we can do? We can incentivize our employees to, to say, if we hire someone and we keep them on Good for point. 60 days, you get a $200 bonus. Good um, point. So recommend your friends. But quite honestly, Mark, the best thing you can do is create a culture, create an atmosphere where your employees want to tell their friends, man, you wish you worked here. And particularly and for small businesses, for independent retailers, because the truth is that the bias already exists in most people that you're better right. off working for a small business than you are for a huge corporation. And so all you have to do is deliver on that promise. Right. And generally, you'll have some hiring advantages. There are some advantages the big guys have, but generally speaking, we'll at least hang on to the advantages that we do have. The first rule, if I consider myself somewhat of a, perhaps a consultant at a, at a kind of 35,000 foot view. The first thing I would tell any small business owner that I'm talking to is 
unless you are willing to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself about the conditions of your business, you are going to do the same thing that you're doing. And any kind of advice, any kind of consulting, anything like that is going to go in one ear and out the next. So, so one of the things as we've had and continue to have this discussion more and more about hiring, you know, one of the most common refrains that I hear is, I can't hire anybody these days, or no one wants to work these days. And the first thing when I hear that is I scratch it out and I say, let me fix that for you. No one wants to work these days for what I'm willing to pay and for the atmosphere that I've created in my business, period. Now you are 100% right. Yep. And now you can start tackling that issue of figuring out, well, if today's workforce has changed, if today's workforce is motivated by different things, how do I create an atmosphere that works for that? How do I create an atmosphere that is attractive to the work pool that is out there today? And I can give you example after example from within this industry and outside this industry of ways that small business owners are doing that. And they are all facing the same kind of wage uh, inflation pressures. They're all facing the same kind of other challenges that you're facing in your business. You know, it's as simple as, you know, the old phrase in customer service that it doesn't, it doesn't cost a penny to smile. Right. And, it, and the truth is it doesn't cost a penny to sit down and show your employees that you value them and that you understand what they need out of this relationship. Again, one of the things I talk about is getting past this mentality that used to be the thanks that employees get for working for me comes every two weeks in an envelope and that's their paycheck. Right. And right. if they're not happy with that, then I guess they need to go work somewhere else. If that's your attitude, fine, take it to the grave, but it's going to be the grave of your business. Right. It's no longer, it no longer applies. That's, that would have been true in my father's day or your father's Absolutely. day, but, but the truth is that just no longer applies. One of the ways to uh, uh, share with your employees, exactly what you're looking for from them is some sort of organized training program. Absolutely. And, and so that was the other topic that I really wanted to get into with you today, because I know that you guys are doing a lot uh, as it relates to uh, training. And uh, you had a big program uh, with your independent hardware stores, and I know that you're adding a lot with the paint dealers. Yeah. So what part does training play into helping dealers hang on to their current employees as well as their new hires? And let's face it, working at a hardware store, a paint store, you got to know a lot. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you have to know, and it's, and it's a difficult learning curve. And what employees tell us that they don't like is nobody likes to feel foolish. No one likes to have someone come in and say, hey, I, I need to figure out what applicator is going to do the best job for this. And you're left saying, man, I, I, I really don't know. Let's, let's sit here and read the back of the thing together and all that. And no one's going to be up to speed on day one. But you need and to provide and show them the pathway for how you're going to get them there, how to answer those kind of questions until they get there. Um, and, and training is a huge part of that. And so where do you start training? You just got a new employee or you just decided that, uh, you know, I want to make an effort to properly train to become more efficient yeah. and hang on to my existing employees. Where does the dealer start? You have to have a plan for how to do this, uh, which is way more important than on day one, what's going to happen on that becomes part of the plan. But you need to put some real thought into what do my employees need to know and what do they need to do to be successful? Then how do I teach them those things? So before you start thinking about day one, you need to start thinking about what are those things and how are we going to do this? The most common training method in a lot of retail environments is. Dan got hired today. Mark's been working here for three years. Dan, I want you to work with Mark and he's going to show you a little bit over the next few days. And then Mary in the office is going to show you how to punch in and punch out and all that kind of stuff. And good luck to you. And then after right. three days, your training's over. And then you'll pick right. up stuff. It's like, well, you got to learn how to drive, you know, right. do a, on the a job. hand lift or, you know, it's on the job training. And when I talk, said earlier about this holistic approach, training needs to take into account what do I need from you? I, I'm paying you a wage. This is what I need from you. How am I going to equip you to do those things and then hold you accountable for doing those things? But a very important part of training that a lot of small business owner, owners overlook is 
what are we, the company, going to do for you to help you grow? And that is one of those those factors that is so important to this next step of how do I hire employees? How do I retain employees? Yeah. And, and one retailer, another real world story that I, and I give this advice is she would sit down with every new hire and they would create a binder. And part of that binder was going through, okay, these are the steps you're going to go through with training. These are the things we need out of you. And this is what you can expect and all that stuff. But another very impart, important part was asking them, where do you see yourself in five years and how can we help you get there? And and so an example would be I'm 19 years old and I'm a sophomore in college for, uh, for graphic design. Okay. Wow. What can we as a paint and decorating store do to help you in that? Could we maybe get you involved in creating some of our vignettes? Can we have you design some of our social media posts? Can we do things? And then all of a sudden the employee trans transitions from thinking, this is a job schlepping paint that I'm going to have for a couple of years till I get out of college. At least I'm not having to flip burgers to wait a minute. These people care about me and care about where I'm going. And if I apply myself, I'm actually going to learn things that'll get me where I want to be in five years. And I can grow. Exactly. Exactly. I I can grow. And, And that opportunity to show an employee where they're going to be in the future is one of the things that keeps employees loyal to you. Absolutely. One of the biggest problems that that employers have is Somebody thinking, hey, I'm 30, how am I going to feed my kid when I have one at 35? If they don't see that path in your existing employees, if they don't see that path in your existing practices, if they don't see that path in some other means in your business, they're going to get frustrated when they don't attain what it is that they're looking for versus somebody who maybe didn't come along as fast as right. he was hoping or she was hoping or expecting, but sees the path, they're more likely to work harder rather than get discouraged. If you don't see the path, you're more likely to get discouraged. And that's what we hear a lot of younger folks entering the workforce asking these days is what's my path? How is this going to help me along my path? I've been a manager for 30 years. I deal with employee motivation and retention issues and so on. Early in my management career, it was one of the most frustrating things to have someone ask me, well, what's my path? And I'm like, for crap's sake, you started here three weeks ago and you're asking me, where can I go next? But now I've learned over the years how important that is to be able to illustrate that this is what we can do for you. And again, I think in a atmosphere where we're we're really trying to get the best of the best employees. And there's this market out there that is much more rigid. And retail employees are already working against some difficulties. Like one of the big ones that's emerged in the last 24 months is work from home. If now you go look at job postings right next to the job posting, in in, in a lot of cases on these online sites, it will say this is an in-person hybrid or work from home opportunity. Well, I mean, most people, not everybody, but a lot of people would say, well, I mean, I can't, I don't have the option of hybrid or work from home in a retail environment. So for those people, you're already kind of challenged. Disadvantage, yeah. Disadvantage. So again, going all the way back to where we started our conversation, if you create an atmosphere where your employees think, and really understand that you care about them, care about where they are going to go, that you're willing to compensate them and make them part of your team and be transparent and yet accountable, you're going to start having less of an issue hiring people. And and it's not, I I wish there was an easy prescriptive, well, just go do this and start advertising online and do that. There isn't. It's about building that culture. And training helps build that culture. Just to get us back to where we sort of started on this topic, it's it's training that really uh, is one of the foundation pieces of building that culture, that understanding that the person uh, who's been here five years longer than me has more knowledge than me because they've been parted more knowledge by the training practices that are in place. That is a a good lesson for new employees to see because it helps them understand where they're going to be in the future. And it helps them understand that they're part of a 
hierarchy of culture and that they have the ability to move up within that culture. And that's what keeps employees staying with you. Well, right. And, and, and here, you know, obviously a lot of what we do at NHPA is about training and it's training yeah. at all levels. I mean, we have the entry level, let us teach you the difference between a roller and a brush and why you would use this versus that. We have all that training. I went out, I found this great guy who used to work at Wendy's or wherever it was. Great attitude. I think he's going to be great fit. Now I have to teach him those skills. We have tons of training on how to teach them those skills and and other people also uh, you, you know whatever your paint line you carry I, I guarantee you they have good training that you can use to teach them about that so you have to say well what is my pat what is my cadence going to be for training them on that stuff but then training them on the other skills the soft skills the salesmanship the selling the problem solving the communication all of those things that you need to do so we, we at nhpa we can offer the whole range of that training from the new and employee on up to business owners. So we're obviously really interested in training. And one thing we always ask when we, when we do surveys about training is we ask retailers, are you doing training? What kind of training are you offering? And then we ask a question about what's your training budget? And it's always interesting to me that I see so many retailers that say, oh yeah, we do training. What's your budget? Well, we don't budget for training. O okay. Yeah. Um, I always say this, and then this is, I, I preach this to my kids and it is, is in your own life. I mean, you could say whatever it is, um, you, you know, I, I'm serious about working out, but I don't exercise. I, I'm serious about whatever it is, you know, but I'm not doing this. And I always say that if you're going to say I am committed to and serious about training, you have to put a number next to it. Things aren't real until you say, I am going to put a number next to it. Uh, how you prioritize your expenses is basically your priorities for how you run your business. If you yeah, don't absolutely. budget any money for training, then you don't prioritize training. It's as simple and, as that. And I'm not saying you need to budget 10% of sales or anything right. like that for training. Even if you start with that yellow pad, that legal pad that you've got out, you've outlined the things that you think are important to train, say, I'm a hundred bucks an employee a year. Is that a realistic place to start? You know, and one thing that I always encourage too is as you're budgeting for training, you, by the way, you can get a ton of training for a hundred bucks an employee a year. You can get a lot of stuff for that. But the other thing I would say is, let's say you say, I'm going to start with a hundred bucks an employee a year. You have 12 employees, 1200 bucks. Say, you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to take another, I'm going to make that an even 1500 or an even $2,000 that I'm going to budget for training. And I'm going to put that other 300, 500, $800 in a, an account for stuff that, that I might not have in my training, but I want to do throughout the course of the year. Or what other retailers have done really effectively is say, I'm going to give every one of you, I'm going to give you $50 a year, Mark, that I want you to tell me how you want to use that for training. And you might say, you know, I, I'm always kind of nervous. I, I mean, I, I know what I'm talking about, but I'm just, I, I'm, I'm more of an introvert. And I'd like to take a, a class at the community college or, or a one-time session on public speaking. Because I think yeah. if I get more confident, that'll help me. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let us, uh, we want you to do that. And, and, and allowing employees to self-direct some of that training again, it gets, it, it, it's a win-win situation. It creates a better employee for you. It shows the employee that I, I, I'm interested in what you're telling me you think you need. And, and a lot of times that also goes back into that, what are you getting out of this job? And, and we want to help you along that pathway. Mark, we could talk for five hours about all this stuff, but what it really comes down to- I'm going to stop you from doing that, Dan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what it really comes down to is creating a culture that your employees want to be evangelists about working for your business. And then that creates demand from the employee pool in your area of people who want to work for your business. And then taking the other steps, like always recruiting, always holding interviews, always, uh, always being on the lookout, all of those things mitigate this, I can't find anybody. And it's not easy. 
I, I, I mean, I, we've just talked about a bunch of things in the last half hour. None of these are particularly easy. You know, some of my presentations lately, I've used that quote from Tom Hanks in the movie, A League of Their Own, where he says, no, this isn't easy. If it were easy, everyone would do it. And that's right. just the truth is being a good, profitable retailer that lasts for generations and generations is hard. And, and those that are willing to say, I know this is hard, but I'm going to do it anyway, are the businesses that have been around for four generations and going strong. And, and those are the ones that are going to continue regardless of the pandemic environment, regardless of the economic environment. They are going to find ways to do things and prosper because they're willing to do that hard work. Well, Dan, that is a fabulous, fabulous place to wrap this up. And I really appreciate your time as always. Dan Trottencheck, the Chief Operating Officer and Publisher at the NHPA, that's the North American Hardware and Paint Association. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. I really appreciate the time. Always happy to be on and talk to people. You, you and I can talk for a long time, Mark. <laughs> so thank you.